ish. Yeah. Sometimes if we have a great conversation going, it goes longer. So it just depends. Uh, some people, that's why I give people a 60 minute window. And then if we just have a great conversation and there's so much content, we lose track of time. It's okay. I mean, I was, I've had actually last week I published my first episode this Monday. Actually it went live. First time I went over, we hit two hours. I've never done that, <laughs> but there was so much health knowledge being exchanged that we just lost track of time. Okay. So, uh, but no, especially if you have a hard out time, I do have a hard out time here at seven, seven PM. So I do have to be out with as well. So, okay. Now I am picking up on some internet instability, but if you're not seeing any problems, that must be on my end. Let me just make sure. There's a slight lag I've noticed between where you, what you're saying and what I hear, and sometimes your face is frozen for a few seconds. Hmm. Okay. Might be then here then. Um, I've been having my IT provider research that because it's, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not, and I've had no issues. The good thing is you coming through fine. And on my end, I don't see any of that. So if I look a little delayed on your end, it doesn't matter because you're not recording. I am. <laughs> okay. Um, as long as it's uh, we, uh, the only thing that may interfere with that is obviously if our conversation, uh, if I come through a little delayed, but uh, again, on my end, you sound great. So. Okay. Sounds cool. good. All right. Let me bring up your intro here. I'm going to modify it since we met at MapCon, have a little more fun with it. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, stand by. I give live intros and then we'll welcome you to the show and we'll get into things. All right, video's already live, and stand by for audio. Hello, good day, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Live the Fuel show. So this evening, we're bringing on a new co-host for you. Uh, this lady has a lot of knowledge to share. I want to pick a little deeper into her brain because I got to meet her at MapCon. And if, for those of you who've been really listening lately, we have just attended MapCon 2017 a few weeks ago, just out, outside of Philadelphia. It is the Mid Atlantic Podcast Conference, and she was one of these speakers there who was sharing a lot of knowledge, which I started geeking out about because there's been casual conversations about me maybe considering a book one day, etc. Uh, but let's get into who she is. Uh, per, part of her core brands is one of them is called the legal nurse business.com. But then she has another uh, business uh, named after her name. Uh, and before I give you her name, I want to give you a little more about her, right? So she understands financial struggles. And this is part of the story that I want to get into today, but I'm not going to give away all the dirty secrets. It's powerful. She went from near bankruptcy twice to being a millionaire. She shares her inspiring story with others. She's a nurse entrepreneur, as I hinted at, who successfully sold her legal nurse consulting business and is now a ghostwriter, coaching, and author provider. So let's get into more about who she is. And again, as I hinted, her other website is her name, patire.com. Welcome to the show, Pat. Well, thank you so much, Scott. I'm very happy to be here talking to your audience today. Well, I'm excited because... I don't know where to begin. You've, you've worn a few hats, right? So I think for me and for our fired up listeners that listen to this show, I think it'd be excited to kind of dig right into the whole bankruptcy thing and helping you and your husband kind of rebuild. And, and this is way before you created these entrepreneurial pursuits. I actually should say you had other entrepreneurial suits in those days. So let's dive back into that. Let's freshen that up because real quick, obviously I remember part of the story it was centered around welding, right? It was. Um, okay. Our, our first time when we almost ran out of money was when I was in graduate school and my husband was unemployed trying to put together a financial package so he could buy a welding company. Okay. And we got down to the point where I graduated from my master's program and we literally had $200 left in the bank. Wow. At that point, um, I was invited to take part in a conference in Beverly Hills to present a paper for the work that I had done in graduate school, and I had no money to go. This is the part of the story that I didn't share with you. I don't remember this part. So I, I got invited to go there, but I didn't have money for a plane ticket. I didn't have money for a hotel room. I had this, we had this $200. Dollars. So one of my professors at, at University of Pennsylvania said, go ask the dean of the school to see if she'll give you some money. And I said, 
you know, that she's, hmm. she's up on this pedestal. She's this famous person. I'm going to walk in her office and say, please give me some money. So yeah, said, I would say I'd be a little pulled back. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, well, you know, she loves it when the students in the school get exposure and publicity. Go and offer to make some phone calls in California while you're out there presenting your paper and see if she'll fund you. So I walked into the dean's office. It felt like it was as big as a football field. It was very nerve wracking. And I sat down and I explained to her that I needed money and why I needed it and what I would do in exchange. And she said, okay, I agree. You do what you have promised to do and I'll give you a check for $500. So on that promise, I was able to get a, a, um, a ticket, which I didn't have to pay for right away on the plane. And then I was able to get a hotel room and give my presentation and make my phone calls to alumni in the Los Angeles area where I was presenting. And then she was good for her word and gave me the money when I came back. So it, it taught me when you really are looking for something that is going to help you a lot, take a risk. Because the worst thing she could have said to me was no. And instead, she sat there with a sort of amused smile on her face and said, sure, Pat, University of Pennsylvania will support you. No problem. Wow. And when was this? I mean, how far back are we talking? That was 1979. Okay. And within a week after graduating, I was in my new job. I started earning money again. And then a year later, my husband now had the funding through the Minority Small Business Administration because he's from India, so he qualified as a minority. Hmm. We signed a personal guarantee, which for those listeners who don't know what that means, is a document that lenders want you to sign to show you are really serious about making this business a success. And everything that you own, you're putting on the line saying, if this business fails, come on lenders, you can take everything that we have. And what's scary is I've listened to other financial and business podcasts and read lots of very successful authors and books in that sector. And most of these people nowadays will tell you, do not do that. <laughs> but yeah. obviously we don't know these things until someone tells us these things. True. And I don't know that they would have given us the money if we hadn't signed that. Hmm. It was in 1980 when the interest rate was 22%. I know, when you told me that figure, it blew my mind. It, yeah, it, it's inconceivable now. We've had such a low interest rate for a long time, but my husband's loan repayment rate was two points over the interest rate, so 24% a month interest was required to repay the lenders. And that number was not workable in terms of the sales that he was getting out of his company. So we That's really, crazy. we were doomed to not be able to succeed, although we had no idea at the time. But did you feel that? I mean, admittedly, as new entrepreneurs, it's like, okay, well, we're excited. We got a loan. We've kicked off our American dream. You know, we're, we have our own business. Yeah, we have a high interest rate. But did it feel like, wow, I'll never be able to get out, get out from underneath of this interest rate? Or did you guys actually feel like you had a chance? I, I am sure that we felt that we had a chance. You know, you have a lot of dreams when you start a business. In hindsight, there were so many things that were clear, like we needed more equity and not so much debt. But it was something that my husband really wanted to do. And I had my paycheck from the hospital during this entire time. So we were having enough money to be able to pay our bills. Mm. Being an entrepreneur, the reality of this was that he was at this welding company seven days a week. We had a, a child who was under the age of five who really didn't see much of his father. And it was a really hard working long hours that in the end turned out to be nothing except for this pile of debt. So when he decided I can't run this business anymore after five years. It was time then to say, okay, what do we do about this personal guarantee and all the money that we borrowed, the million dollars that we borrowed, 
we don't have that to be able to repay it. And we all's, don't all's you, I mean, if a business was run properly, the only thing you pretty much are falling back on most likely is going to be the equity, right? In the business, the property, the equipment, et cetera, right? Yes. Yes. There was a building involved. There was manufacturing equipment. There were lathes and milling machines. So those could be sold. And what he did was negotiate with the lenders and say, if I get you back 10 cents on the dollar, will you release me from this debt? Hmm. So the, the lender came into our house, sent a representative from the company to look at our house to determine whether it was worth taking as part of that personal guarantee phrase that I told you about. Scary. And at the time I was, I think, five months pregnant and envisioning delivering my second son in, you know, putting him in a cardboard box and us living on the street. But the lender took pity on us and decided not to take the house. And we were able to negotiate. My husband's a very good negotiator that, <laughs> that they would let us off the hook for the amount that was agreed upon. So he sold the building, he sold all the equipment and Everybody finally walked away and said, okay, you know, you're done. Your obligation is over. So we did not have to declare bankruptcy either when I was, we were running out of money when I was finishing graduate school or as a relation, as it relates to this particular business. I mean, that's, I, I can't even imagine what it must have been going through his mind. But what, what were really both your minds back then? Because you, you were giving up an income stream, right? I mean, did you guys have any other fail-safe plans to fall back on besides you, what you were starting to build yourself? No, we didn't have any other plans. Uh, we had borrowed $10,000 from my mother to help start the company. And when she saw the business failing, she called us up and said, I want my $10,000 back, which was also at a low point for us wondering if we were going to be able to survive financially, but hmm. she was concerned about her own security. And I understood it after I got through my emotional reaction to that particular request. So my nursing background was really the security that we had. And then ironically, my husband's business was being a sales rep. So he basically ran his business out of our house for the next several years Hmm. And didn't need a building and didn't need the welding equipment and didn't need the employees and didn't need the break-ins. Another aspect of running your business when you have a company in an urban area is that you get phone calls in the middle of the night from the security company that says, Mr. Iyer, your building has been broken into. Or one time we got a call that said, Mr. Iyer, your business is on fire. Wow. Somebody in the neighborhood decided to burn down a wooden door to get into the plant the day before Thanksgiving and a train going by saw the door on fire and called the local police and the firemen. So that's the aspect of having a physical building that you never really think about is you've got this responsibility for this business and this building 24 hours a day. And if it's in a poor urban area, which is where this was located, there were people who figured out how to get into the building and steal things and mm -hmm. throw papers out of the filing cabinets and take tools and, you know, just malicious things that were going on. That's scary. I mean, it's basically you're questioning your own security. Mm -hmm. Luckily, no one was ever in the building when the break-ins took place, but there's a real sense of violation to know that somebody's been in your office space stealing a camera that my father gave my husband or throwing papers out of the filing cabinets, which take hours to put back in place. It's very unpleasant. Well, so let's, let's fast forward. I mean, not to skip over this because gosh, that's just crazy, but clearly major life shift. Um, he found the power of reducing some of the overhead you know, the, the, having the freedom to run the business, his business out of the house. Were you also at that time starting to build the nursing independence and entrepreneurship mindset behind your knowledge? Or was that still early in the game? Were you still just doing the nursing? I continued to do the nursing. He, he shut down his business in 1985. I hmm. started my business in 1987. Okay. Um, 
from two filing cabinets and a board that bridged the filing cabinets. That was my first desk. And I made a decision as a result of what we had gone through that I would not borrow any money. As I told you when I met you, if I couldn't afford it, I didn't buy it. So I started my business as an expert witness and then continued to, to do some teaching, to do some writing, a lot of entrepreneurial things as I built up my expert witness experience. Hmm. And then one day an attorney asked me to review a case that I was not qualified to review. It was an emergency room case. That was not my background. So I connected him with a colleague who was a very well-qualified emergency room expert, put the two of them together, and then the light bulb went off over my head, and I said, well, she's going to bill him directly. If he wins the case, he's going to make money. I just did both of them a wonderful favor, but I don't make any money out of this arrangement. So with that insight, I realized that I could supply expert witnesses to attorneys. I could bill for their services. Mm -hmm. I could mark up their hourly rate, and I could make money for every hour that they were billing. Yes, because you'd become an outsourcer to them. You're, you're providing a service. Yes, exactly. Which they bill back to their clients. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. It's interesting because even my own fiance, she's a uh, equine vet for horses and she's a doctor of chiropractic for animals. And she's actually been brought in and consulted on a couple of cases already uh, in mm -hmm. the past year. And obviously not to the level you're involved with, but she, she was brought in to consult on a write-up and then she was brought in just to give her professional feedback in a certain case that was being legally battled or whether or not mm -hmm. another vet had, you know, made a mistake or whatever. So sure. it's, it's interesting. I, I, it's all of a sudden, boom, it just connected with what you're mm -hmm. talking about with what mm -hmm. she did. Yeah, there are cases involving veterinary medicine that can be very uh, high dollar value. Think about what would happen if a racehorse ended up lame as a result of malpractice by a vet and how much money that case mm. could be worth. I didn't Very work true. on vet cases. I worked on nursing cases where there were, you know, injuries that ended up paralyzing people or, or um, killing them or, of course, less dramatic outcomes as well. And then we also worked on medical malpractice cases involving physicians and physical therapists. So all of that accumulated to the point that when I sold the company in 2015, we had billed more than a million dollars a year for the last five years that I owned the company. Wow. And there was a lot of owner benefit in associated with those billings. Big change from your husband's business and the struggles that you guys had to endure to get to that point. Yeah, it was a big change, but I think Scott, you learn from your experiences if you're paying attention and you're awake and for my husband being able to take his skills and put them in a situation with much less risk was important. He also became interested in the stock market and developed expertise in puts and calls and options, which are fairly sophisticated methods of earning money. And with my business and with his stock market activities, that has enabled us to build wealth that we didn't have before when we were struggling in the 80s and in the 90s. So that five years you're referring to, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, it, it, that entire five years was under this brand, your legalnursebusiness.com? The company that I had uh, when I was offering the expert witness services and legal nurse consulting services was MedLeague Support Services. Oh, okay. And that's the company that I sold in 2015. Gotcha. So and unless you have an NDA you signed, I mean, who buys something like that? Was that, I mean, it's, it's, I always like to hear some of these little nicks and crannies in the entrepreneurial world. Like, were you planning on buying it or did somebody approach you and was it a private buyout or was it like, you know, like a legal company wanted to buy it and have the rights to it? I mean, I don't know. We tried on our own for about three or four years to sell the company and we found quite a few legal nurse consultants who wanted to buy it but they didn't have the money. Sure. They had the interest, but not the money. And we didn't have the expertise to be able to say to them, 
will go to SBA and this is what you need to do, a small business administration. So finally, a year before we sold it, we approached a business broker who had done mailings. Another interesting point in this, Scott, was that he had mailed us maybe twice a year. Hey, if you ever think about starting uh, selling your business, here I am. (laughs) And my husband filed his letters away. I threw them out. And then my husband pulled the letter out and said, you know, I think we ought to talk to this guy. So we interviewed him and another business broker. The first business broker, not this guy that we went with, said, um, what my terms are is that I take a, um, I take 20% of the fee if you sell the company and you pay me $1,000 a month as long as it takes for me to sell the company. And I sell about 50 to 60% of the companies that I take on. Okay. The broker that we went with said, you give me 10% of the fee and I sell 90% of the companies that I take on and you don't have to pay me anything on a monthly basis. Oh, I like that. So we did too. Yeah. So we, (laughs) we said, okay, you know, you're on. And then, He did a great deal of work in terms of going through the financials, putting the material together for prospects. And then once we settled on a buyer, we had several offers. Uh, The first two or three fell through. We were also very clear on our terms that we wanted an outright purchase. We didn't want an earn out, which you may have talked about on the the show, Scott, of basically it's, it's high risk for the owner which essentially, in my limited understanding, meant we'll take your business over, and if we do well, you get paid. And if we don't do well, you don't get paid. Yeah, some people are drawn to that because they feel they still get a piece of it, even if they're not involved. Uh, but to your point, you really lose control, and hopefully they're actually you know, giving you proper reporting, and they're not hiding numbers and money and everything else. So sometimes it might be best just to walk away. Yes, yes. We were more on the suspicious side about the hiding and the manipulating of the numbers. Hmm. So we took an outright purchase and uh, I always thought that the company would be sold to a legal nurse consultant, an attorney, a doctor, but the business broker explained to me that the people who are buying businesses are more in the range of people coming out of corporate who have 401k money, Hmm. who are excellent business managers, but might not have technical expertise. So they can run the business and then bring in those legal nurse experts to basically build a team behind the brand. Yes. Yes. Nice. And that's what happened. Those are the people who are out looking for businesses. We're just the profile that he explained to us. Wow. So then obviously after all of that, is that when you launched legal nurse business then? Because you already had all this expertise and you have this knowledge because this is obviously yes. a separate brand. Yes, this is the brand. This is the after version of me. After selling the company, I provide education for legal nurse consultants and coaching services. And then the other piece is that I'm a ghostwriter and an author, as you mentioned earlier. So I work with people who are not legal nurse consultants, but have expertise and really are looking for somebody to help them translate that into books. So when you became the ghostwriter, did it come from all of this just because you dealt with so much legal stuff? And usually when I consider legal stuff, pardon the term, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> so I was just wondering, were you, just, were you just that immersed into reading and documentation and paperwork that it just was a natural transition? I've been writing for publications since 1980. Hmm. And that includes books, articles, chapters, case studies, online courses, all told, I've either written or edited over 800 of those entities. So I've always enjoyed writing and I've always found it came easy to me. Hmm. And then a friend of mine asked me to help him write a book on body language and negotiation. That was my first experience ghostwriting and now I'm working on several other projects and I enjoy it. I find that I'm able to talk to another person develop some interview questions and help organize the information in a way that would make sense to a reader. Because usually you're too close to your material 
to be able to really figure out how to organize it well. True. So, I mean, and, and it's interesting because I was always wondering about that and, and um, I'm just going to stop sharing the site for now and go right back to you. Uh, so again, to our listeners, guys, we, we always have a YouTube feed. You guys can, it'll be linked in the blog article on livethefuel.com, but you guys will be able to see some of the site sharing or just go to the website. <laughs> um, as, and again, all this is linked in the show notes. So did you find that getting into book, uh, this ghost writing thing, which is really, let's be honest with you, I was really intrigued by the entrepreneurial struggles the losing millions, rebuilding millions, then you creating a company, selling a company. Now you've got multiple brands, multiple sites. Um, It's been a hell of a journey. You have a lot of life experience to share with people. So I could definitely see that if I was in a legal nurse business realm or that side of things, or even people are listening to this right now, it's like, wow, I never even thought about that. Clearly, I'm sure your coaching is quite knowledgeable. (laughs) Uh, But with the ghostwriting thing, I, I get it. Like you said, it's sometimes people are missing things. They don't know how to structure it, organize it, and like maybe take content. Like you were hinting at, I might literally probably have a book already in my podcast episodes because I've already published over 111 episodes already. So there's probably chunks and pieces spread throughout all of that. Mm-hmm. So, but there's another side of this. Like, how do you write it? Like, do you just automatically know to adapt to whatever target audience that I may want? Or is that part of your consulting too, where it's like, oh, well, listen, here's the content that I found. This is how I would structure it. And oh, by the way, this is uh, probably the audience you might be able to get to that because there's almost a marketing piece to that too. Do you get involved with that at all or no? I get involved in helping the author determine who is the target market because I think that drives everything. Hmm. You know, in your instance, for example, you have three topics that you cover in a podcast. As I understand it, you might want to aggregate, collect the podcast transcripts for one of those segments and say, this is the business content, for example, and we're going to focus on business owners. And then what are the shows that really hone in on that audience? Hmm. Or we're going to focus on health, which I know is another area that you address. What are the pieces that people find most interesting about health? What are the parts that really are challenges for people? Right. Like dietary uh, th- ideas. Like we've, we've talked about different lifestyles like paleo and, and, uh, and ketogenic lifestyles and NSNG, no sugar, no grains. Like there's been so much jargon tossed out there. So I'm sure mm-hmm. there's definitely plenty of car, you know, content on that. And I've even had a guy on here that lost 200 pounds. So discussing weight loss and, 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 and mm-hmm. some pow- powerful stories actually. Mm-hmm. So I, I see your point that, yeah, I mean, I, I've even, after meeting you, I've, I've, I've put it on my board, a to-do list here. I've actually, hold on a second. I don't know if you can actually see that. Let me move the camera. Can you see these three circles here where I'm pointing? I yeah. see where you're pointing. Okay. At the well, arm. Anyway, I, I drew three circles because a possible website redesign is I might want to chunk out all the content into health, business, and lifestyle. And mm-hmm. like, okay, well, when people come to the site right now, it's just they, all the episodes go in order and that's the history. But I'm like, okay, well, what if we find a way to aggregate it and say, hey, you know what? Out of all these episodes, these were... We talked about all three maybe in these episodes, but maybe it leaned more heavily to a business demographic versus a health demographic versus Mm -hmm. a lifestyle. So Mm -hmm. yeah, you inspired some thoughts in my head. So, um, but admittedly, most of my ideas were presented in the beginning about a book concept was people, multiple people have messaged me since launching the show or just people following me on social media and like, you know, it'd be cool to hear the story about the whole transition into wildland firefighting and back again. And just that lifestyle from like, you know, farm kid to big business world to farm to firefighting guy to back to more entrepreneurial, you know, focused efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's where I was like, you were saying, you know, Scott, that content might be hiding in those episodes and you have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) And I know we've talked randomly about firefighting. It's, It's obviously, it's a part of who I am. So I know it's scattered across plenty of episodes. So, but that's interesting. Like, is there a lot of people who do what you do? Like who have figured that out or is it a specialty? I think ghostwriters are behind a lot of books by famous people, but we don't realize because they're a hidden population. There may be people 
who will put the name of the ghostwriter on the cover, like on the book that I did on body language and negotiation. Mm -hmm. So it says Greg Williams with Pat Iyer. But there are individuals who don't want don't want it to be known that they had a book written by a ghostwriter. Yeah. So that appears nowhere. But that person clearly didn't write the book, doesn't have the skills to write the book, but was able to work with a person to capture the individual's voice and tone and story and make it happen. Well, and let's be real. There's probably also maybe people who are also maybe just really busy like myself, and I just don't have the time to sit down and write it. And I can write. Uh, clearly, I have blog articles, and we do show notes and everything else. But again, find the time to do it. So, and also, it sounds like even though you're a ghostwriter, there's still a lot of back and forth, right? You still have to, the author, aka the owner of the content, should still be consulted with and like, hey, how does this sound? How does this feel? And then obviously, you're, you're probably playing a lot of back and forth, it sounds like, to eventually get to that end yes. product. Yes. Um, I recorded a session, a chapter today with the author. Uh, we're working on a new book called Negotiating with a Bully. So mm -hmm. we started off with a set of questions, but it, then it turns into a discussion and I probe and ask additional questions that he had not anticipated I would ask him, but because he knows this content so well, it becomes a more free flowing dialogue. And that's what you get with a person who's working with you is helping you see something that you should cover or coming up with a new question that you hadn't thought of. Hmm. Interesting. So if there's listeners listening to this, because I've had, I've had numerous authors on the show and some have self published, some have not, uh, some have actually produced a book good enough to be approved by a publishing company and all mm -hmm. that. So uh, it's funny because uh, there's a famous guy, Vinny Tortorich. He's been on two or three times. He wrote fitness confidential. He self published, uh, but he didn't write it by himself. Uh, he, I, I don't have to look it up while I'm talking to you because he had a famous guy from Hollywood help him co-write the, uh, the book. Mm -hmm. But the point is, because he's not a writer, <laughs> uh, but his message, he wanted to get the message out there about the back, the you know, behind the scenes of the fitness world and his struggle through surviving cancer and everything else. So it's like, hey, there's a story to be told. Mm -hmm. you, you need help getting it out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, do you come across that often too, where people do want to tell their story and, and then they just stumble across you as a ghostwriter or how's that come about? The people that I've worked with are all people that I have met in person and have known from some other aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the women I'm working with now is a speaker and I, she did a podcast for my podcast called Legal Nurse Podcast. And then afterwards talked with me about helping her with her book. A couple of the guys I'm working with now were referred to me by another person. So I think it's, it's essentially a level of feeling comfortable, feeling a level of trust. Hmm. And getting to that point of saying, yes, the world needs to hear my story. And if it's up to me, it's going to stay buried in me. But somebody else can help me bring it out. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, real quick, I will share the screen again. But um, his co-author, as the image comes up here, was Dean Laurie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know that Dean Laurie does stuff like that, but I believe he's like a famous screenwriter, I think, because he's in the Hollywood world. And this guy, Vinnie Tortorich, is the trainer to the stars. He basically is a professional trainer, grew up in little old backcountry Louisiana. So... Um, but power of your network, right? Knowing the right people. Dean told mm -hmm. him, hey, man, you got to write a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, it is because here's the funny thing. We talked a lot about podcasting because you and I both spoke uh, at the MapCon event. And Vinny is one of those examples where they said, oh, man, we, let's write a book. But he's like, well, how are you going to sell it? Mm -hmm. And friends of his said, you should launch a podcast. And this is like five years ago. And he's like, well, what the hell is a podcast? <laughs> Yeah. And, he's, and they said, well, it's like, it's a way to control your platform. You could talk about whatever you want. And if it's a successful platform and you give it enough time, you build followers. And then if, and when you do decide to maybe create some products, maybe you self promote it on your own show. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what he did. And mm -hmm. he, he's the best selling author of that book. So excellent. Yeah. So it's interesting because like I, I never thought about writing a book 
obviously there can be, if you are successful to, you can gain a good financial return on it. Uh, but sometimes to your point, some people just need to get the story out there. And if you could positively impact, that's, this is how my brain works. If I could positively impact a few people from maybe getting a book out there, that's exciting, mm -hmm. uh, right? To maybe mm -hmm. hear their words come back, their reviews come back in a positive light. That could be exciting. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of stories that need to be shared. A lot of people who have done, well, unusual things like you have of going into burning forests and putting your life on the line to control fires. That's not something that very many people have ever ex had exposure to or would be able to do. No. And admittedly, you and I talked about this because I'm from the East Coast, so I didn't even know about it until I met a girl who I briefly dated who was going back to Nevada where she was from to go do that. And then I just became obsessed with learning about it for the next two years until I finally made the jump and went for it. Um, but when I went out there, I was like, you know, East Coast people, we don't know about this unless it's on the news. But even mm -hmm. if it's on the news, you're not, you don't really know it. There's no behind the scenes videos or anything unless we share stuff on social media nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will say, though, coming up, I think it's October or November, the first ever movie about Hot Shots is coming out. So it's actually going to be about the actual Hot Shots 19, who I knew who had passed away in 2013, the 19 firefighters who were burned over on a fire on the Yarnell Hill fire in uh, outside of Prescott, Arizona. So their base was about an hour and a half away from my base, and we fought on a lot of fires together. So. Mm -hmm. But if they, they decided to bring in some major actors to write a movie about it. So now this may increase knowledge of what hot shots are and what that lifestyle is. I don't know what to expect from this movie. I may like it. I may not. I don't, I don't know. So, mm -hmm. um, but maybe that'll help me inspire me to finally get around to doing something about a book. <laughs> <laughs> It would so, be a great idea. But what's your advice? And people like, hey, table, use me for example. Mr. LK, people tell me I should do it, but I don't really have time to do it. I'm sure there's other people listening to me right now. We talk about this on the show a lot about people are afraid to, to make a big change. And this is what I spoke about at MapCon, right? Embracing change for you know, lifestyle success because it may not happen tonight or tomorrow, but you will eventually gain success out of making these changes and embracing the struggles. And it sounds like you've experienced this with multiple clients when it comes to mm -hmm. book writing. Mm -hmm. so how do you speak to that? You know, I think if you allow yourself to be encased in fear of taking risks, which many people are, you'll have a very limited life. Mm -hmm. We had an experience which I think typifies this several years ago when we lived in a house with a, it had one bathroom in it. And our son's father was unemployed. He was a union carpenter. And we said, we need to have this bathroom renovated. You're out of work. We need to have the work done. This would be great. You can come and take care of this for us. So he said, okay, I'll do that. And then I said, and you know, the kitchen counters are really in need of replacement. Do you think you could replace them too? And he said, oh, no, I'm not a general contractor. I can't do that. So he came to our house. He pulled the bathroom cabinet away from the wall. He pushed it up against the tub. And then he proceeded to come an hour a day for two weeks. He never showed up before 1030. And I said, how come you're not here working all day? And he said, I have to go down to the union hall because I have to look for work. Mm. And meanwhile, work was sitting in our bathroom. And it finally got done. It was very inconvenient to climb over the counter in order to step into the tub. And, I, and we never hired him again. But I envisioned that he was in this lucite box. He could see the world around him. There was definitely a lid on this box. And he knew his world, and he wasn't going to go beyond his world. And he wasn't even tuned in to our world and our need for him to get this done. Come on, you know, this is very inconvenient. I, and unfortunately, this is not something uncommon that I haven't heard before. I'm not, I'm not going to officially bash unions, but in the modern era, for example, I'm, I'm right here. I live in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Right next door is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Well, 
One of the largest corporations in the world was headquartered here called Bethlehem Steel. Their steel was used in World War I, World War II, Empire State Building, Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, you name it. They ship steel all over the world. Well, fast forward years later, that company doesn't exist anymore. And everybody was a union laborer. And everybody was guaranteed a pension. And then all of a sudden, 10 years ago, the pension got displaced. So all these people who counted on that pension, even when the company folded, were still told they were going to have that pension. And that's gone now too. Mm -hmm. It really affected a lot of people. And we're only an hour and a half from New York and an hour from Philadelphia. But to your point, whether they liked it or not, there was blinders on. And that's just what they know. And people feel, people back in the day were trained and coached that the unions are there to be the warm and fuzzy protection. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, if you're in a hardcore industrial labor-based job, I get it. But nowadays, and people say, oh, well, you're guaranteed work. Well, you're only guaranteed work if that job wants to be a unionized job. There's a lot of people who don't want union labor. Some, some places are loyal and they do hire union labels. So I see your point. It's that person was all union all day, all along. And he was missing on all these entrepreneurial opportunities to make the money that he needed. But he was waiting for the union to come through and nothing was coming. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people who are not entrepreneurial. Only 5 to 10% of the population is entrepreneurial. But when you focus on entrepreneurism, you know a lot of entrepreneurial people. You think about starting businesses. You, you look at a situation and say, I could fix that. It's very heady. But the reality is that most people don't think that way. And, and they're comfortable in a job where they have a job description and policies and procedures and they know what they're supposed to do. And if they weren't comfortable, you and I would not be eating because we need people who will bring the groceries to the grocery store and unload the groceries and put the things on the shelves. But this guy at a critical time when we needed him to be entrepreneurial was not able to. And that's what I took away from it, that I had to realize that my way of thinking and running a business and looking at the world is not shared by the majority of people. Hmm. You know, I have to agree with you. I've, I've had to struggle with that myself. And because and, even myself, like I, I, over the years, I had struggled. Oh, my God, do I take the risk? You know, do I try and do some entrepreneurial things? What are people going to think? People question me like, Scott, you know, you should be out there with a, I have a degree and I have a great resume. You should be, you know, running a company somewhere. I'm like, well, how about I just build my own, you know? Yeah, that's true. Or, and then while along the way, along the way, I get to help other people build their businesses because they're my clients, right? Mm -hmm. They're so it, the difference is I'm my own boss. <laughs> so it's interesting. I, I agree with your point that not everybody is wired that way or as I said in, our, in my, my conversation at MapCon, is we're just all at a different place on the timeline. And that's something I've realized too, is that maybe it's only five to 10% of the population as you hinted at, but also that five to 10% is also at a different place in the timeline. They've either spent the time doing the training or, or surrounding themselves with other entrepreneurs, or they're just getting started and they need podcasts like yours or mine to start getting their brains wired right. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the reasons why you launched your, your podcast? You know, I launched my podcast because I realized I was reaching a lot of people through the many books that I've written, but I didn't have anything that was in oral form for the people who prefer to listen. As okay, an educator, like audio. I know people are... Some people want to listen. Some people want to participate. Some people want to read. There's the three different learning styles. Mm -hmm. And all of my material was either webinars or books. And I was missing out on people who wanted to listen while they were driving to work or cleaning the house or walking the dog. So it was essentially to provide knowledge in a different form. And then I realized that I could repurpose it for books, for podcasts, I mean, for blog posts, for other methods of getting content out to people. So it's like a cycle. All right. 
so besides obviously, so you figured out, well, great. I, I created that niche in that legal nurse world, right? Then you realize, okay, let's take some of the best practices. Let's take it outside of that specific niche. And is that basically what you're hinting at with the podcast and everything else? You decide to fuel that into the, the patire.com site, which I'm sharing right now, because this is really you at, at its core, not, not just nursing specific, right? True. This is my speaker site. And then the tab that's marked editing that is close to the woman's head is the page that describes my ghostwriting services. Oh, okay. So I'll have to dig deeper into that because I don't know if that was actually shared to me when you had uh, uh, applied to come on the show. So, uh, and I love to research people even deeper. So, mm -hmm. and I just want to learn more about ghostwriting. It's crazy. Like I've, this is, I, I told you at MapCon, this is not the first time I've heard it. Uh -huh. And some people are promoting it now. And actually, I know at least one person who does have a ghostwriter doing it for them and they're taking their, their time. It's, he says, it's actually nice because they just, they talk once a week, they gather content, and then they catch up again the week after. <laughs> mm, it's a great way to do it. Yeah, I don't know how you do it. I mean, is, there, is that one of your best practices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's easiest, I find, for the people who have the knowledge to have a recorded conversation with me and then the transcript gets turned into a chapter. And that's what I do is take out the dialogue and smooth it all out and reorganize it and make it flow and turn it into a book. So that's a good point. Even if you don't have a podcast like I already have with a year's worth of content, you could just be recording a phone call. Exactly. Okay. Is that most of your clients basically? Yes. That's the pattern that I've been following so far. Okay. I mean, who knows? This could be moving us closer to working together. <laughs> this is fun. Because um, I'm like, oh, man, like she could just get started by digging into all my podcasts. And then that's right. And then we just save the phone calls for when you have questions or there's something like sticking in your head and you want to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk more about this offline. <laughs> all right. <laughs> again, our listeners, guys, we're geeking out a lot about this stuff. But I think the big picture out of this, and again, I'm sharing her course site, which is patireyer.com. And again, all this stuff will be clicked in the show notes. But the point here is, if I had to sum up the whole show for myself, hearing everything today and what I learned about you at MapCon is, we're all capable of doing so much. It's just, where are you at? What do you want to accomplish? And are you thinking outside the box? Then, of course, adapting to what you had hinted at about a couple of minutes ago about what kind of learning style are you, right? The VAC method. Are you visual, auditory, or kinesthetic? I studied that uh, in the university. And then, um, hey, maybe you do have a book in you. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just have a small blog you want to launch. Or maybe you want to go audio like Pat and I and launch a podcast. The point is, at least think outside the box of where you're at today. Like you hinted, that gentleman was not thinking outside the box. He was still closed off in his union world. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I got out of this. So, well, listen, Pat, I, I want to make sure that I'm getting you, you're getting back to me, but I, something I want to, and I want to make sure you hang tight when we end the show here today, but something I've always wanted to do for our podcast co-hosts is I want to give you the closing conversation, right? The closing comments, the closing thoughts to our audience, because if they forget everything else we talked about, but there was something they can hear from you in the end that would inspire or motivate them to, to follow you and go to your site. Like, what is your mission? I mean, this is obviously not a sales pitch. This is like, what is your mission behind everything you're doing? What is the big picture? What are you trying to, I don't know, maybe leave behind to the world? with everything you're trying to accomplish here? I would encourage your listeners to take a look at what they really want to do. If they are interested in expanding a business or starting a business, which is the world that Scott and I inhabit, do your research, but don't be held back by fear. There will be times that you stumble. We all have stumbled. We have all made mistakes, but it makes us stronger people. I would rather see you take a risk, do something that you really want to do than to be held back and to have regrets. Regrets will destroy your will. They'll destroy your mood. They'll destroy your happiness. And as I'm sure Scott has said many times, you're going through this world once. There's no return trip. Do what you need to do for your own happiness and satisfaction and financial security in this lifetime. Well said. Thank you. I love that. And I, the biggest thing I love, and I, real quick for as we close out the video feed and, and the audio feed for our listeners, guys, I'm going to share the site again, patire.com. 
Again, her other sites, her other social media will be all linked in the show notes. But the biggest piece that I really just is stuck in my brain is the no regrets. I mean, you have a lot of powerful words and all that will be notated in the blog content. But again, to our listeners, guys, no regrets. Pat just told you this. Okay. This is a woman with years of experience. She's been through the bottom and the top. <laughs> There's been a great story here that's been told today. So to our listeners, guys, that's Pat Iyer. Check her out at patire.com. And again, live with no regrets. So as we've said on every other episode of this show, keep living a fired up epic life. And we'll talk to you guys again soon. And you're clear of the pod. All right. Well, you're a very good host. I try. Thank you. I'm <laughs> trying, to, trying to make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> I try to make it easy. That's why I do open conversational format. I want us to just to flow. You never know if the internet's being weird, which apparently the internet's being weird tonight. I hope it wasn't too much of a struggle for you. Uh, I'm sure there was delays. So. Well, I didn't detect it. Oh, good. I think it was behaving itself pretty well. Okay, because I kept seeing, see, I, I see everything. Zoom gives me alerts. I'm seeing red bars pop up. I've, <laughs> I was like, okay, something's not working very well. I don't know what it is. I might have to call the provider and have them reset the feed. So, uh, or I'm just going to man up and just buy a commercial pipe because then I'll never have an audio problem ever again. But I'm like you. I'm still minimalist thanks to the firefighting. I, I don't like to spend money unless I have to. I'm, I'm, I'm still wiping out mistakes that I was making back in the day before the firefighting. So there's still a some life decisions that need to be paid mm -hmm. off. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and, and you just reiterated the importance of that. Like part of my uh, freedom trifecta is that I want time freedom, location freedom, and financial freedom. So that way you're never feeling held back. If I want to pick up and go, I can pick up and go. If uh -huh. I, uh, I don't want to have debt anymore. That's my biggest thing. It's one of the things that's held me back from even considering doing a book because I'm kind of really excited about the whole self-publishing thing because then I can just put whatever I want out there and I don't care what the publishing companies say, but they say, well, that's a lot of money. Like you got to pay for that yourself. <laughs> Have you had people do that? Like do the whole self-publishing thing? Yes. Um, self-publishing is a very good option, particularly if you don't necessarily look for a traditional publisher because the traditional publishers nowadays are moving more like a hybrid between a traditional publisher and self-publishing mm. in the sense that they may want the author to purchase some copies of the book, but, but more importantly, they want the author to do all the promotion. There's right. no They're getting lazy. Of, of salespeople. Or so there's no advantage. You're just providing, oh, we have the printer and we have the relationships, we have the network, but they're not going to do anything with that network, it sounds like. All you're going to do is be able to say, oh, I was published by this big brand name. They can get your book into bookstores, which is very difficult to do when you're self-published. I right. found the negotiation book in a bookstore in Portland, Oregon, when I was there earlier this year. But the man that I worked with had to purchase, I think it was 500 copies of the book. Wow. And they organized a lot of PR for him. A lot of interviews were set up in the first two months after the book came out, and then it all stopped. Yeah, it's a big ramp up. And, and then he gets 10% of the wholesale price. Ooh. So if he were purchased, if he put his book through CreateSpace, like my books in CreateSpace sell for $29.95, it costs me $3 for that book to be printed. Oh, nice. And, Interesting. You know, so I'm, I'm happy with what Amazon is doing by putting money in my bank account every month. Well, and that's part of my master plan. Like I, I, I want to give back, but I, I also have to realize like I've, I've, I've done a lot of charity work over the years, a lot of donating time. And, and I have very, very successful friends of mine. Like Scott, we get it. You love to give back. You love to help people, but like eventually you got to get paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're like, you still have a life to take care of things too. And I'm like, huh, good point. You know? So, you know, if it'd be, it'd be, and I'm really excited to find automated monetization strategies like a book. Okay. Once you get it out there, I have no problem uh, promoting it myself. I'm a marketing guy. I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about that, but it'd be cool to have it on Amazon. And I definitely want an audible version because a lot of the books I listen to, like I have a library, but I don't have time to sit down and read it. I listen to it in the car all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I also have the strategy of if I publish a book, it's going physical and digital. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's um, a great point. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm a big Audible user. I, our library, I, my fiance wasn't into it until a year ago and then I gave her access to my account and now she buys almost, she buys more books than I buy <laughs> because she drives around as a vet all the time. She's crushing books faster than I am. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. look, who, look who's hooked on the Audible. So, mm-hmm. and that's something we have control over because Amazon owns that too. Very nice. Have you released any of yours in auditory, Audible? You know, I have not. Hmm. Uh, I only have them in print form, and I haven't really thought about recording them. But now that I have done some podcast editing, I realized that the editing process is not nearly as mysterious as I thought it was when I was on the outside. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very difficult, but I've discovered ways to... Like when I make a mistake, I clap my hands three times. Okay. That that signals to me that's the piece that I've got to take out. And then there's me where I don't edit anything. (laughs) (laughs) The only thing we do is we add an intro on and an outro on and I keep it all natural. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and I've actually had a lot of great feedback. People appreciate that because I'm just keeping it real. But in a book, it's probably a little bit different. And some people pay voiceover artists to do that for them. And they said the biggest struggle for audio is that you have to be consistent. Like if you're recording one day and then you're recording another day, is your voice the same? And mm. they, they bring that up a lot too. But I was like, well, I already made the decision. If I do an auditory book, I have to do it myself. It's my story. And I have a podcast. So like, why wouldn't I be doing the audio myself? Mm-hmm. I already have a $400 microphone. Come on. <laughs> right. So, yeah, you got the um, equipment. so, uh, well, I mean, so, uh, what else would, I, would you recommend me start researching if I was going to wrap my head around maybe considering doing something with a book stuff? Because I would want to get started. I don't know. I feel like I should at least do something as soon, at some point. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, it's always like on the to-do list and then I just never do anything with it. So, You know, you talked about the movie that's coming out. And yes. it, it sounds to me like there's a couple of choices that you have, which is one is is taking content from your podcast and turning that into a book or telling your story and turning that into a book. Your podcast content's going to wait, but if you are wanting to capitalize on people's interest in firefighting and what happened to those unfortunate 19 people, I think Mm -hmm. that project has a higher priority if you had to look at the timing question. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And that's where people said the same thing. Like, oh man, it'd be great if you could have a book come out right on the same time. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to rush it. And should we be, do- and is that, is that, is that me being inappropriate? I don't know. I mean, granted they, they passed away years ago. So, I mean, it's, it's been five years now. So, um, mm-hmm. so it's not like it's, uh, it's still fresh enough, but, and again, when I thought about it, I would actually probably, uh, and actually real quick, I'll, share the screen for your benefit. So the, the movie is called only the brave and they've got major actors, uh, Josh Brolin, miles Teller, but uh, one of the major actors is Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges yes. plays the superintendent of the crew who dies with his men. So, mm-hmm. um, and his story came under all kinds of question because people question whether or not he made the right decision to help them escape the right way, the wrong way. Did he actually kill his crew? There's all kinds of controversy over it um, because he, he make a mistake, stuff like that. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I was like, oh, you know, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I have no idea. But what's involved in ghostwriting? And this is all extra video content. We're just throwing extra, uh, like I said, it's more behind the scenes stuff because the video keeps playing and then I just stop it when we're all done. So <laughs> I see, okay. Yeah, it's more fun that way. So in terms of ghostwriting, well, I talked with you about the pattern that I have very successfully used in the past of interviewing the person whose story we're going to be telling, Mm -hmm. creating questions in advance and sitting down and recording those conversations and then turning that content into a chapter. So essentially, there needs to be an outline of which chapters to address in which order, and then figure out, and you don't have to start in the beginning, you can start in the middle of the story. For example, if you wanted to tell your personal story, you might start with the fighting of the fire, and that could be the the first chapter that's recorded, or many books very effectively 
pull you in by starting with a dramatic story and then fill in oh, with like, like like when we got chased out by a wall of fire after getting off the trucks like literally five minutes later yes that's a dramatic story okay. so you start with you're looking at this wall of fire and you're saying why we shouldn't world, be here right now why did i volunteer for this why am i not safe in my home in allentown pennsylvania why am i here and you put the reader right in the middle of that fire and then you fill in, all right, this is how I got to that point. This is what motivated me to do this. This is what consumed my life for hmm. two years. And now based on what I went through, this is how it's changed me. Well then, and, and how does this, so again, cause it's all new to me and I, I'd have to figure out how to start budgeting for this and stuff too. Like, do you do it where, do you do it like the publishing companies where you guys, like you do a, a piece of the sale or do you just do it? Is it like an hourly build service? Cause I haven't really dug into that on your site yet, but I'm like, how's that all work? I have no idea. I'm just very intrigued too mm -hmm. from a business standpoint. Cause I can mm -hmm. see you doing both sides of it. Some people may want to do it on an hourly basis cause maybe they never print the book. Other people, they're hardcore. They know they're going to book's going to come out. And then there's like, Oh, you could always do a piece like the publishing company. Like how does that all work? Well, the model that I'm most comfortable with and the people I've worked with is most comfortable with is determining what the price would be for the project. Hmm. And it will be published. It'll either be published by a major publisher, which is uh, the, the company that's handling negotiating with a bully, or it will be self-published through CreateSpace. Right. And it's going to come out. It's not going to be a project that will languish. There okay. is one woman who hired me to be a developmental editor to help her organize her material and move it along. And she paid me the initial retainer and now she's stalled. She has no time in her life to write. She didn't want me to be her ghostwriter. She wanted to do the writing, but she is so busy with her job and with courses that she teaches that she's been stalled. So, she's, so her message isn't getting out there. It, it isn't. And ironically, she would like to write about work-life balance and dealing with stress. Well, clearly she's not ready to publish the book because she's not, she won't be able to live to the words that she's going to write. So, um, wow. Maybe hopefully that, that'll break through and she'll realize. And here's the thing. What if that book becomes successful or could have become successful? That book sale, with your help of ghostwriting it, could be creating some of the financial freedom. I mean, I don't know how much financial freedom comes out of book sales, but usually it's, you don't think about the first book. It's that just gets you going. And then you start releasing multiple books. Like Grant Cardone is like a sales genius and he's got like five, six books out there now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure not all of them were successful, but now he's got all of them linked through Amazon. They're all for sale through his site as well. So he's, so like people like me, I went back and bought two or three books last week from a couple years ago because I didn't have access to all of his volumes. So now I'm mm -hmm. accessing other content that he published a while ago. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Well, you'll have to, um, I mean, we'll have to follow up. You'll have to let me know what's all involved in, in, in what, what would it take to get things going and, and stuff like that? Because I, you have me very intrigued and I just, you know, I don't know. I got to figure something out. <laughs> well, wonderful. And you uh, do have a story that's unique that needs to be told. It is very unique. And everybody keeps telling me that. And I just, admittedly, some of it's in my own inner crap. Like, I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't write about it because, you know, I lost colleagues. And it, I, but then at the same point, like, the story needs to be told about, it doesn't even have to be about them. We can have a small piece about Hot Shots 19. But, you know, the, one, of the, one of the blogs I read on the firefighting site that I told you at MapCon that inspired me to even become a firefighter was, it said, so you want to be a hot shot with a question mark. And then they list all of the ridiculously hardcore crap that they put you through on purpose to hopefully turn you away. So mm -hmm. it was almost kind of like a Navy SEAL type concept where like, pff, you're not going to want to come do this job because you got to do all of this yep. and then some. And that's what actually drew me in because <laughs> I was like, I don't like people telling me not to do something. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Well, uh, well, great. This was great tonight. I thank you again for coming on and making the time. I can't wait to get you live up. I know I'm only I'm waiting for my editor to get back to two of my episodes, which will be 
Friday and Monday. So you're probably going to be out by the end of the month, if not the first week of October. Okay. Perfect. And I always, I always update everybody. And then you, you'll be on the site. You'll be blasted across all the social media like I always do. So, um, Terrific. And if there's, any, if there's any other links that you think you might have missed that you want in the show notes, make sure you email them back to me. Because okay. I, I, I pride myself on very detailed show notes. And I want to make sure that everybody can find your Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, plus, it does save me a little bit of time writing up all the show notes because like, then I don't mess up people's links. I'm like, hey, if you guys got profiles you want people to link, get them to me. I'll put them in there. Plus, okay. it makes Google happy because Google likes to see all the backlinks going to everybody else's sites. So That's right. All yeah. right. Terrific. It was that- great spending time with you today, Scott. I had a blast and just learning more about your story and other things that you didn't tell me MapCon was wonderful. So you have a lot to share. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else I could do for you this evening? I think we're good. I All appreciate right. it. Well, thank you so much. You have a great evening and uh, I will, uh, we'll catch up, I guess, virtually. <laughs> okay. Take care. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.